Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I was talking instead of turning. Hang on one second. 1 Corinthians 13. There we are. And verse number 11, I want to run, we'll read one verse to introduce the Bible study tonight, and then we'll get started. The Bible says, when I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. Father, I pray that you will bless the reading of your word tonight. God, I pray that in, in everything we say and do might be for your honor and glory. May Christ be exalted May our, our spiritual walk be enhanced, and may we be more in the likeness of our Savior because we've been here tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat> All right, but Josh, just, I would turn this down just slightly. It sounds a little bit, a little bit harsh, okay. Uh, by way of interpretation, this verse, we're going to apply it in just a moment in a different way, but... But this verse, uh, when you read this passage of Scripture, it seems to come out of nowhere. It seems like it's completely just, just kind of, you know, just throw it on the page. Wherever it lands, it lands. But it really is not that. And you know that because that's not the way God does things. But, uh, but what does it have to do uh, with? And if you read the context, it's talking about about uh, spiritual gifts, <clears throat> about sign gifts, etc. And so you, you go back uh, uh, to verse number one, though I speak with the tongues of men and the angels, have not charity, have become a sounding brass or tinkling cymbal. Uh, verse two talks about the gift of prophecy, mysteries, and knowledge, and have all faith to move mountains. Without charity, I am nothing. Uh, the the gifts of giving, uh, et cetera, in verse number three. And that's interesting because that sounds like that's what charity is. But it is possible to give your goods to feed the poor and do it for the wrong motivation. And so still not having a, the, the attitude, a charitable spirit. And so then it goes into an explanation of what charity is. It suffers long in verse number four, uh, suffers long, is kind, envieth not, etc. It uh, goes all the way down through verse number seven. And the Bible then says, charity never faileth. But whether they be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether it be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Now, these things about, <clears throat> about uh, tongues, back in verse number 8, uh, prophecies, tongues, uh, ceasing, uh, knowledge, vanishing away. Uh, these are uh, sign gifts given to the New Testament church in its infancy. And you have to remember that while this letter, this, this book of the Bible is originally a letter, amen? Amen. The letter to the church of Corinth. Uh, as New Testament documents go, it's, uh, it's fairly early in the writing of the New Testament, which means that there aren't a bunch of New Testament books laying around. There is no complete uh, uh, Bible yet. They have the Old Testament scriptures, but the New Testament has not been written yet. And so when you get to the day of Pentecost... God pours out the Holy Spirit in such a way to verify the message of the, the apostles. And it does exactly that. What was the gift of tongues? The gift of tongues, the Bible describes it, that the, the Jews, that the apostles spoke in Hebrew in their tongue. But the Jews that had gathered there from all over the world that spoke multiple languages they all heard each in their own language. So uh, that tells you from uh, the law first mentioned what speaking in tongues in the New Testament was. It was not gibberish. It was not uh, un, unintelligible uh, vowels and consonants. Someone spoke in one language, another person was able to hear in their own language. That was the gift of tongues. And it was given... 
uh, to verify. The Bible says, wherefore, tongues are for a sign. And so what was the sign for? The sign was to va validate the message. Why did they need that? Because they did not have a complete Bible. Today, uh, if you want to validate what I'm preaching, what I'm saying, you just have to look down at your Bible and say, oh, yeah, I see it right there in front of me. They couldn't do that because they didn't have a complete Bible. And so God gave the gift of tongues uh, as a sign for them to validate. Uh, and who was it that looked for the sign? The Bible says the Jews looked for a sign. Greeks sought after knowledge. It is important for us to understand, again, I'm trying hard not to get off too far on, the, uh, on speaking in tongues, but I do want to at least make sure that we cover it at least in general while we're there. And that is this. Uh, if we have the right understanding of speaking in tongues, then you ought to be able to verify it th through looking at times in the New Testament where someone actually spoke in tongues. There are only three occasions where someone is where it records someone speaking in tongues. Every time there were Jews present. Every time there were Jews present. And every time the Jews present said something to the effect of, well, how can we deny this, seeing as the Holy Spirit poured out on them as it was on us at the beginning? In other words, it validated, it, was, it, it proved to the Jews present that the message or what was happening was of God. And, and you find that uh, all three times. And so I think we have... Not only do we have the right understanding of it, we have the proof of it uh, recorded in the scriptures. And so, um, and, it was, and it was because, notice back in verse number uh, eight, uh, because uh, these things would fail. It doesn't mean, when the Bible says prophecies will fail, it doesn't mean they won't come to pass. It means that there will be, there'll be a cessation, an ending of speaking prophetically. The word prof, prophesy or prophet is found two ways in the Bible. Number one is when people foretold something. It's like they're telling the future, things that have not been revealed. Then also many of the prophets uh, simply preached something that had previously been revealed and so that's, uh, the one is foretelling, in other words, telling something in advance of it happening. The other is telling forth or forth telling, which is simply saying, thus saith the Lord. And, and everybody knows that he said that. And you're just preaching what God has already said. And so in the, in the vein of prophecies of telling future events that were unknown, he said, that's going to come to an end. Doesn't mean when it says they'll fail, doesn't mean they won't come to pass because everything God says will come to pass. The things you understand and the things you don't understand are still gonna come to pass. They do not require your stamp or your understanding to validate them for that God's gonna do what God is going to do. But it will cease being necessary to foretell the future. And so, whether it be prophecy, they shall fail. Whether it be tongues, they shall cease. Now, does that mean that no one will speak languages, that we will evolve to the point where we just telepathically, uh, you know, communicate one with another? No, except for husbands and wives. And, and they will always be able to finish each other's sentences. But anyway, uh, so once in a while, my wife gets it wrong, though. I said, that's not what I was going to say. And, uh, and so, uh, but speaking about the gift of tongues, the gift of uh, what happened on the day of Pentecost, what happened uh, in Acts 19, what happened the other time, is that they heard, uh, one person spoke in one language, the others heard in a different language, as a sign, and it says that that will stop 
being in use. And then it says, where there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Now, what does that mean? Knowledge will vanish away. We're just not going to know anything? No, knowledge was a gift of being able to, uh, to know something that had not, you don't have any proof of yet. You don't have, you know, God reveals it. God revealed things to different men that had not been prophesied, had not been revealed, and the gift of knowledge. Uh, he says it would vanish away. And he said now, at the time of the writing of 1 Corinthians, now we know in part and we prophesy in part. And so prophecy was not... Uh, absolute or complete. In other words, there are things to be known that have not been prophesied yet. Uh, you know, there's a lot in the Bible that is prophetic that we don't understand. Amen? A lot of things that we get into the book of Revelation or if you're, if you're you know, reading in Ezekiel or whatever and you read, uh, you know, about ladders and angels ascending and descending and wheels within a wheel and times, times and a half and, and uh and you just love your times tables. And so you, you, know, you do that and you say, well, I'm just going to blank this out. And so you move on from that. Uh, all of those things. But even at that, the recorded prophecy of Scripture is not, is not the complete story of everything that's going to happen. There are things that are going to happen that God has not revealed. So what he has revealed, we still don't understand. But it is in part, prophecy is in part. When that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away. So these things, I believe, is to say these things were necessary because uh, the, the scriptures were not complete. Therefore, they needed something to validate or verify what was happening uh, was from God, and to tell them uh, what was going to happen, etc. So there were these sign gifts. There was the gift of knowledge, the gift of prophecy that were in part. And then when that which is perfect, the word perfect means complete, has come, that which is in part be done away. We know what was in part. It was the gift of knowledge, uh, uh, tongues, and uh, prophecy, uh, because it says these were in part. And so uh, when you let's skip over verse 11 for now and come back to it. Uh, for now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now that looking through a glass darkly means shaded. It means uh, restricted or hindered. It's like, you know, if you're really super cool, you'd be in there here tonight. Uh, for Bible study, wearing shades, you know. You say, well, it's not dark in here. Yeah, but if you were cool, you'd still be wearing them because that's what you do. You still wear the shades. Uh, but, you know, it's like it, it, it darkens your vantage point. It, it hinders the clarity with which you can see. And so now we see through a glass darkly, restricted, uh, hidden, if you will. But then we'll see face to face. Now he says, I know in part, uh, but then I shall know even as also I am known. And so he's talking about again, knowledge. Uh, he's talking about uh, 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 prophecy. And then he says, and now abideth faith, hope, and charity. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. And so he's, obviously, 1 Corinthians 13 is elevating charity. Would you agree with that? Say amen. Uh, it's, it's exalting charity and say, look, all these other things won't matter if you do not have a charitable spirit. And in this mix gets this verse thrown in there, verse 11. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. And for many uh, years, I really didn't understand how it fit the context. But I believe I do now. And the way it fits the context is that it is saying, it is using a physical illustration 
for a spiritual truth. And the spiritual, tr the physical manifestation is that when somebody is young, when they are a child, they think like children think. They absorb things, they care about things that children care about. They, uh, you know, uh, I, when today when the, the, uh, the uh, truck, you know, uh, the driver didn't see the cable and ripped the whole mast completely off the house and off the, the, um, the uh, panel box, you know, where, you know, your meter, your meter box and ripped that completely off of that. And that was really cool. And so, you know, they got to come out with the big truck with the boom on it. And the uh, guy's up in the boom and he's ratcheting the, you know, and, and I took pictures of all that. You know, you, you know, when I show, when I send those pictures to my grandsons, they're not going to care that we were without power most of the day. They're not going to care what it's going to cost for the emergency, you know, call out of the power company. They're not going to care about any of that. They're going to go, cool trucks, Papa. Cool trucks. Those are awesome. That, that's, they think like children. And so... Uh, when somebody's a child, they think like a child, they understand like a child, they, they, they uh, understand, they, they uh, speak as a child. But when they become a man, they put away childish things. They grow up. They mature. Not always, but most of the time, it's good if they do. Uh, I often say growing old is mandatory. Growing up is optional. So the application for this is in the context of the church in, uh, of Corinth and spiritual gifts is that the church in its infancy needed certain things that apply because it is a baby church, because the, the church is young yet. I mean, we're looking back through 2,000 years of church history but they weren't doing that. They were first century Christians. I mean, they were, they were right there. And so the New Testament was not completed. They didn't have a, a full Bible. Um, Holy Spirit has just begun indwelling them. I mean, this is all brand new. And he's saying the reason that these sign gifts were in part and would cease is because they were there for the infancy of the church. But when the church comes to maturity, it puts away the childish things. So these things are no longer necessary. And I believe that's the importance or the meaning of verse number 11. And so uh, the Bible study tonight is not new but it's something we revisit regularly. And, and I simply call it the call to maturity. The call to maturity. Maturity means that we are able to use good judgment to be responsible and act with restraint. That's what maturity means. And so he was saying the church, when it comes to maturity, puts away those things that were necessary for its infancy. And he uses the physical illustration. So now let's go back, now that we've interpreted the passage, I tried to interpret the passage, let's go back now and let's apply it to the Christian life. In that there are things when we are first saved uh, in our infancy as a Christian that are going to be true. We're gonna think like a child. We're going to understand like a child. We're going to talk like a child because we, we, we're just brand new Christians. But as we grow, God calls us to maturity and to put away childish things. Uh, look at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. In Ephesians chapter 4, notice in verse number 14. Verse 14 is part of a really long sentence uh, that uh, begins in verse number 11. and goes down, I believe, through verse number 16. Uh, that whole thing is one 
big, long sentence. Uh, you want to drive yourself crazy, try diagramming that sentence. Uh, it is pages and pages and pages of diagramming. Uh, and if you hate English, don't do it. Um, and so, but notice verse 14, that we henceforth be no more children. The word henceforth means from this point forward. That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Here we have his letter to the Ephesian church, saying, church, uh, this is a call to grow up. All right? Mature. Um, don't, and, and he gives characteristics of childhood, carried about with every wind of doctrine. Every time something blows through the church, somebody comes across some, they think they found the secret doctrine hidden in the Bible, no one else knows, preacher won't preach it, and, uh, and they found it on the internet probably, um, and, uh, and, but they've got the secret. And they're carried about with every wind of doctrine, uh, blown here, blown there, back and forth. And so, what does he say? Be no more children. Don't be, don't be uh, moved by every slight of men, conning craftiness, uh, deceitfulness. Don't be easily swayed. Children, uh, you know, are... are because they are innocent, they are trusting. And you can talk kids, I mean, you can, you can talk them into just about anything. And uh, sometimes they almost agree to anything. When our, when our kids were small, um, trying to think of which one it was, this was about. But anyway, one of them. Uh, I, but uh, you could just about say anything, and they, they would just... Just, you know, I think it's, is that dog in the cartoons, is it Odie? That's just, you know, and that's the way they were. They just, yeah, they just eagerly shake their head. Yes, yes, yes. And you can say whatever you want to say. Uh, do you want to grow up to be a pirate? You know, do, uh, you know, you, uh, you know, are you, are you going to, are you going to join the circus, run away and join the circus? And you'd say, you know, are you, are you going to, you know, be a mass murderer? And they, they didn't care. I mean, they just, and, and, but and, until you'd say, you want to go to the nursery. And they go. That's the only thing they knew. Now, again, they had no idea what the other things were, but they knew what the nursery was. And they knew it was not, not, not where they wanted to go. And so, but what's happened? They're just a child. They just think like a child, they, they don't understand. And so you can, I mean, children, because they are innocent, they, they are malleable. They are, they are you know, uh, manipulative. Uh, they can be manipulated and et cetera. So, we, you know, you want to be very careful doing that. But uh, uh, to not do that, I should say. But, but, sh but we are that way spiritually if we're not careful. And God is saying, be no more children. So what are the characteristics of a child. Uh, well, a child is immature. That's not being criticized. That's not being critical. Children are immature. Um, this simply means simple minded. You know, uh, the, try to talk to kids about diet. They don't care about diet. Give me the ice cream, right? Uh, it doesn't, doesn't matter. Healthy, not healthy, doesn't matter. Uh, because that's not on their radar. Uh, kids think like kids. Sometimes adults think like kids. But uh, childishness is immaturity, simple-minded, etc. And and you, there's a distinguishing thing between the two. Uh, when I was just over watching uh, the two oldest uh, grandsons in Michigan, the the parents of the children, they, they wanted to get out of town, so I went over there to watch the boys. They wisely found a different babysitter for Luke. 
Yeah, because leaving him with Grandpa at this time, you know, G-Dog is not ready for that little guy, okay? Uh, he's, he was not potty trained, okay? So, we, we, so they found separate quarters for him. Uh, but I had the other two, and I didn't tell Mom and Dad. I didn't, uh, I didn't want them to say, no, I can't come which they would probably do. And so when I got there and they were gone, and so I got the two older boys, I said, okay, here's what we're doing this week. And I brought out, I had taken a set of throwing knives. And I said, we're going to find a chunk of a stump somewhere that we can tip up for a target, and we're going to start, we're going to learn to throw knives. And so I've got videos on the back porch throwing knives into this this you know, Target and stuff and having a good time. And, uh, and, but, you know, and so we were doing that. And you say, that's childish. Well, no, that's not, that's not childish. I mean, uh, my wife said she just heard a news story this week about some little girl that somebody ran out of the woods to grab her. And her brother saw it, and he had a slingshot. Did you all see that in the news? He had a slingshot, and he, reached, and he I think he hit, nailed, with his, hit the guy right in the head. I think he hit him in the head. And then he, a second time, drove him off, saved his sister. I'm just saying everything about Huckleberry Finn is not bad. I mean, and uh, so weapons, you know, appropriate for the age is, is a you know, useful thing. And so he must have been practicing if he was that good at it, either that or God guided his rock just like he did David's. Amen? And uh, coming out of the sling, you know, he... A ugly giant heat-seeking missile, you know, and uh, and so now, if we said, "Hey," uh, which the boys would probably do, "Hey, this will be fun. Let's one of us hold the target and run across the yard, while the others throw the knives at it." <laughs> there needs to be somebody that says, this is not a good idea. And, and that was me, by the way. <laughs> and I know it's not a good idea because when I was a child, I thought as a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child. And when one of us, many years ago down in Texas, got a bow and arrow set for a, for a, a present, I don't know if it's Christmas or a birthday, whatever it was, and... Uh, and it's just it's a target, you know, it's not like a, the compound bows we have today. It's a target set of air, but it did have, I mean, target points on it. So we decided it would be a good idea to take turns with two of us running across the field and the other one, see how close you can come. That's a good thing. We didn't know what we were doing. See how close you, does it, okay, see how close you can come is a recipe for, oops, didn't think I could actually get them. Uh, now, you know, quickly, now there needed to be somebody there who um, oh, matured enough to say that's not a good idea. That was our mom. She saw that going on and put a stop to that real quick. You see, because when a child is immature, simple-minded, um, easily, uh, easily influenced, uh, they, uh, he said, when I was a child, I spake as a child. How did children speak? Very common words, simple meanings. Uh, and that's the, the word for speak here. That's exactly what it means. Just It's a common word for speaking. And so I spake as a child. You expect children to say things that are just kind of goofy or silly or whatever it might be and you expect that because of the immaturity but when we become mature or grow up we put away some childish things and so then he said I understood as a child the word understand means to exercise the mind it means to care about and always in the bible the word understand is used in a positive sense in other words To understand in the Bible means to care about important things. To exercise the mind about important things. 
And so, to think about things that matter. You see, when you start getting uh, a little bit of maturity, uh, you can start you start thinking about things that are going to matter. At some point, I mean, I mean, there's nobody likes school. Thought I'd get an amen there on the front row. Um, nobody likes school. But at some point, you start to realize, you know what? School's going to be important. Until then, you say, here's what you say. I'm never going to need this. I'm never going to use this math. And you don't, you think about it. You don't even know where you're going to be a year from now. How can you possibly know you're never going to need that math? I'm never going to need to know this. But more than anything, you're learning to learn. And that's the important thing, is that you learn to learn. Because if you learn to learn, it doesn't matter what course God directs your life in, uh, you'll achieve something in it because you take it seriously. And so to exercise the mind, to care about. And so even a student, even a young person will start to realize, you know what, it, it does matter. It does matter that I apply myself because it, it dictates the kind of person I'm going to be. It dictates what kind of person I'm going to be. Those that uh, will take on responsibility will become, pro, uh, will become productive people. You take a guy that never, never takes school seriously. He gets out of school and takes on a job and he doesn't take that seriously. He can't hold down a job for more than just a few weeks at a time. And from job to job to job. That guy, don't marry that guy, girls. Because that's the way he's going to be probably the rest of his life unless he grows up. And, uh, and when you, you girls, when you get looking for someone, you're, you're not looking for a little boy to take care of. You're looking for a man that will be a godly man and a leader. And so uh, why does all this matter? Because when we mature, we put away childish things. Things to understand as a child. Uh, what does that mean scripturally or spiritually? Well, Matthew 16 33 says this Thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that are of the world. What does it mean to savor the things that be of God? It means that you have an acquired taste for it, that you enjoy it, the things of God. To be immature as a Christian means still in that stage where it sounds like thou shalt not and can't have fun and all those things. But when you grow up spiritually, you begin to realize this is what is good for me. We enjoy uh, Bible study. We begin to enjoy uh, reading God's word. We begin to enjoy uh, preaching, get, begin to enjoy the spiritual things. What's happening to me? We are learning to savor the things that be of God. Romans 8, 7 says, the carnal mind, worldly, carnal mind is enmity against God. Remember, we're talking about the way a child understands or lacks understanding. Romans 12, 3 the Bible says that a man ought not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly. Okay? What is it to think more highly than you ought to think about yourself? It's to just care about you. Just, it's just about me. I'm the only one important here. I want my way, not realizing that there are other people to be concerned about. Or that it really won't matter, right? Uh, it's not in the long run. It's not, you know, going to be that bad. I'm, I was driving today to go get parts to fix the electrical uh, thing, so I can get power hooked back up. Call my mom. Say, "Hey, mom, how you doing?" She goes, "Doing really good today." I said, "Well, that's one of us." She says, "Oh, well." She says, "Well, I'm sitting here. Sun's shining. It's not raining. It's not snowing." I'm comfortable in my chair. I've, I've been fed, uh, et cetera. So it's a good day. I said, do you have power? She said, yes, I do. I said, we do not. She said, oh, what happened? And I told her, she said, oh, that's unfortunate. But she said, these things are just things to 
learn from and, uh, you know, just learn to trust God with. And it's not why I called mom, by. Uh, <laughs> so, no, I didn't. No, I didn't do that. <laughs> I call my brother and cheer him up, right? You know, no, <laughs> no, we talk, but, she, but she's right. The, you know, these things are not going to matter. What is important is that uh, we walk with God, uh, learn what it means to get our prayers answered and have the power of God, see people get saved. Um, I have two appointments tomorrow to, to sit down and, uh, with, with, with men and take the word of God and try to help them from the scriptures. And that's way more important than, than all the rest of this stuff going on. And, uh, and so, but you don't get that perspective thinking like a child. Uh, and so, not think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. Colossians 3, you know, it's like, why is this stuff only happened to me? Well, maybe because you're a ding dong or something. Anyway, I don't know. Uh, Colossians 3, 2. Set your affection, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Why? Well, it's because that's where moth and rust do not break, uh, do not uh, uh, corrode it, and thieves don't break through to steal it. And so you begin to realize that the things of this world are not going to be as important. Set your affection means that you intentionally put your love toward things above. This is what, what are we talking about? Starting to grow up, the call to maturity. Um, he said, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, and then he said, I thought as a child. The word thought means to take inventory. It means to reason. The word for thought comes from a Greek word that, mean, that is sometimes translated to reckon something so, to think it so, or to suppose it is so. It is the conclusion of analysis. In other words, when you analyze something, the conclusion you come to is what is meant by thought. I thought. And so when you can't come to the right conclusion, when you can't think it through, you're thinking as a child uh, instead, when you become a man, you put away childish things and you begin to think as an adult, think as a, uh, a, a mature person. And so let's look at Titus chapter number two. We're starting to draw a conclusion here. Titus chapter two. And in this, uh, we were in this passage of Scripture, part of this passage of Scripture recent, very recently on Mother's Day, and, uh, and we were using a different part. But tonight, let's look at beginning in verse number 6. Young men, likewise, exhort to be sober-minded. That word, sober-minded, phrase sober-minded, means serious, to think seriously. In other words, consider some things seriously. To be sober-minded, in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works, and so learn to be an example. If, other, if the people following you uh, turn out like you, will they be mature? Will they have the right perspective on things, uh, a pattern of good works in doctrine showing uncorruptness or purity of truth, purity in doctrine. Uh, then it says um, gravity, grave means uh, very honest and, uh, and sincere, um, gravity, sincerity. Sincerity means being genuine. Uh, sound speech that cannot be condemned. And so speaking the truth, holding the truth uh, forth. Uh, and so uh, 
sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. And so for speaking to someone that is young, he says, grow up, mature, think seriously, um, you know, be pure in your doctrine, be serious in your in uh, uh, gravity and genuineness and truthfulness and holding the truth and to do these things because it, it's going to matter. And too often we grow up too late and uh, have made choices and decisions that have, have done great harm to our own lives sometimes. People have made decisions um, in their youth uh, that cannot be undone. And uh, it, is, it is important that we begin growing up, taking things seriously. Until we are able to do it, uh, we really ought to... Uh, by the way, that's, you don't come out of the womb doing that. That's why God gave you parents. <laughs> you were wondering why that happened, right? Why did God give me parents? <laughs> uh, because somebody's got to make sure that just keep you safe until you're ready to start make to grow up and learn to be mature. And I know every teenager thinks they're mature. They think they have all the answers, but they haven't heard all the questions yet. And um, uh, I think if you had a chance... Um, to uh, talk to some of the people that I talk to that have spent their entire adult life in prison, uh, they would tell you, uh, you know, you need to start thinking seriously about life early. You need to, uh, you need to grow up and be mature and think uh, the right way. And so Paul says, when I was a child, I thought as a child, I understood as a child, I speak as a child. Uh, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. I want to just challenge you that um, living for God, okay, living the life that God has given you is important because God expects you to do something with it. Uh, The talent that God gives you, meaning the life that God gives you, uh, you're going to give an account for it how you have used it to serve the Lord. And so to do that means taking seriously. It doesn't mean, uh, I'm not of the mindset that if young people are having fun that they're somehow, you know, just crazy uh, teenagers or crazy kids. I think you can have fun, but when it's time to take things seriously, that you take things seriously. Uh, That you begin to understand the importance of, of the decisions that you make to think in terms of, let me just give you a couple of thoughts here. Think in terms of eternity. Well, I've got lots of time to make that decision. No, you don't. The decisions are here in front of you each and every day that will last for eternity. So think in terms of eternity. Think about what you will want to give an account for. Think about what you'll want to answer for. What will you want to stand before the Lord and answer for? So think in terms of eternity. Number two, think in terms of your testimony. Maybe you're not trusted because you're not trustworthy. You know, we can get all upset that people don't trust us, but if we're not trustworthy, it's our own fault. And so take responsibility. Be responsible. Don't always wait to be told. And by the way, you'd be surprised how much, how much less trouble you would have in your life if you would live um, a, a self-controlled life. Because then you don't have to have people telling you all the time and writing you all the time. You say, well, they just do that because they're, because they're being, no, no, they're, because you won't do it on your own. You know, it's like, okay, listen, it's, it's the end of the month. Take a shower. 
right? Once a month, whether you need it or not. No, but just to take responsibility. Uh, so think in terms of eternity, think in terms of your testimony, and then remember uh, that uh, life involves relationships. Uh, love is a giving emotion, not a taking one. Love is a giving emotion, not a taking one. If we're going to do it, the Bible says that we love one another. That means we're going to be giving. It means we're going to be uh, uh, doing things for others. Um, we want love to all be incoming, and that's not the way it works. Now, uh, given it shall be given unto you, right? Laws of sowing and reaping. Uh, we love God because he first loved us. We're returning his love. And that's how we build a life of faith. That's, that's the kind of people that, that are willing to give their life for the cause of Christ. That's the kind of people that Brother Wilcox reads about on Sunday morning. Uh, they're taking their testimony seriously. And some of those people he read, that he reads about are teenagers, they're young, um, and we can scarcely get adults to take, the, take their Christian life seriously. To, I mean, the, the, the fact of the matter is that there's a lot of people that just, when COVID hit, they just laid out a church, used COVID, but they haven't come back since, you know, they haven't come back. And it just wasn't important to them. Uh, you say, well, maybe they're still afraid of COVID. Well, they're doing everything else. And so it's just, it is just not important to them. We, you pretty much do what you want to do. You make time for most of it. There was, and there's all kinds of, of illustrations. Um, uh, there, in, uh, in, there was a pastor of, uh, at uh, Tiberius. You read about the Sea of Tiberius. It's in North Africa. Uh, there was a pastor of a church there named Felix. And he, is, he was put to death August 30th, 303 AD. And he was quoted as saying, it's better that I be burned than that the word of God would be burned. He held such high regard for God's word. Uh, that's not frivolous. That's not childish that's not uh, immaturity. That's, that's maturity, gravity, sincerity. And uh, listen, we can still have fun. Uh, we can still enjoy what God has made. Uh, but we also need to take serving the Lord seriously. God calls us to maturity. In the New Testament church, he, Paul was calling the church of Corinth to maturity. There were things in the first in that first letter that he wrote that needed to be corrected. And he wrote to correct them, and he called them to maturity. In the second letter, he commends them for their choices and decisions. You know, uh, that's, we all have the opportunity. My uh, namesake in the Bible, John Mark, he started slow. He quit after the first missionary journey. But, and we don't know exactly why, but I, my assumption is, and I'll just tell you what I assume, my assumption is that in his youth, he uh, did not understand uh, how hard it would be. He didn't understand being away. We, we know his, his mother uh, named Mary, was, she was uh, very involved in the New Testament church. In that first church, she was the play. I mean, she opened her house for prayer meetings and things like that. Uh, but, uh, you know, so maybe he just hadn't been that far away from family. Uh, maybe not suffered the way that they were beginning to suffer, whatever it might have been. But he quit. He started slow. But then he matured. He grew. And to the point that Paul said, bring John Mark with you because he's profitable. Uh, so he goes from being a quitter, immature, uh, to profitable. And so, so we can. And so we can as well. 
Father, I pray that you would help us as we've studied the word of God tonight. Lord, we've tried to be careful in our interpretation of scripture. We've tried to be uh, practical in our application of scripture. And God, I pray that it would cause us, uh, present us with the opportunity to actually do something, to move forward in our Christian walk, to grow, to mature, uh, to put away childish things uh, like, well, let somebody else uh, serve the Lord because uh, I don't want to do that much work or I, I don't want to give up my Saturday or I don't want to do this or whatever. And Lord, childishness that only thinks of themselves and their own comfort. God, I pray that we would uh, find, uh, uh, find in Jesus Christ the example that we need and draw close to that example. Uh, we just give you all the praise and the glory for what you will do uh, through that in Jesus' name as we stand to our feet.